Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Floyd. <laughs> I'm married to Sally. We got married really young. I was uh, 21 and Sally was 18. And that was uh, 48 years and seven months ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I still love her very much. <laughs> We got two precious kids who are grown adults, Misha and Matthew, and uh, Misha's married, and we have two grandchildren that we love, Kezia, who's 14, and Luke, who is 12. And I live in Cape Town. Sally and I have lived all over the world. We've had the privilege of uh, traveling a lot of countries. I've been in 196 countries, and I haven't been to Mongolia or North Korea or a few other places that are hard to get to, but... We're working on the Mongolia piece. <laughs> yeah. So a few years ago, uh, God put it in our hearts to move to South Africa. So we've been living in Cape Town for the last nine years. It's kind of hard if you've ever been to Cape Town or seen pictures of it. It's kind of hard to claim it as a mission field because it's so beautiful. It's a city of immense um, beauty and immense pain. About four, four and a half million people. You can drive for about 10 straight miles, about 12, 13 kilometers maybe, to be more exact, through uh, communities one after another with one-room shacks where people are living in t terrible poverty. One out of every two women in Cape Town are raped. So it's a community, a city in pain, but at the same time, it's got all this incredible beauty, the beaches and the mountains and so on. So we get to live there. We, we are really thankful for the privilege. We've lived in lots of places. Sally and I spent time in Afghanistan. And then uh, we spent 18 years working in the red light district in Amsterdam. And then we were back in the States pastoring and planting churches and now in Africa. Uh, we've written some books about our experiences, our kind of journeys. One is called Living on the Devil's Doorstep which tells the stories of living in Afghanistan and Amsterdam. When we got to Afghanistan, we learned a lot about the culture of the people. And the Afghan people believe that uh, when Satan rebelled against God in heaven uh, and God kicked him out of heaven, he landed in Afghanistan. That's what they believe. So we found out that we were living on the devil's doorstep. And then when we moved into the red light district, we lived next door to a Satanist church, literally lived on the devil's doorstep. So that's a story of some of our adventures living there. And um, I've written a book called The Father Heart of God. <laughs> it's uh, now in about 45 languages. If my English teacher from school knew I was writing books, <laughs> she'd be raised from the dead today. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get good marks in school. I did not get good marks in English class. But... Um, yeah, this is, this is the story of how God impacted my heart with his love. And more importantly, it's actually the story of some other people who encountered God's love. So we just talk about one of the greatest needs we all have is to know that we're loved. And uh, the pain that we have, um, even from the best of our fathers struggling to love us, and then how God has encaptured people's hearts with his love. I actually wrote it. Uh, when Sally and I were living in Amsterdam for some non-Christian friends who really struggled with that whole uh, concept of God as a loving father, I got my hair cut. Whenever I got it cut, it was pretty long in those days. And um, Ellen used to tell me how much she hated God because of the pain she had in her relationship with God. And I thought, if Ellen would ever read something, I talked to her about this, but I thought if she would ever read something, what would I like her to read? So I wrote it with a view that we could give it to our friends who are not yet following Jesus, and they could read it as well. And um, then I wrote a book about the rest of us called Learning to Love People You Don't Like. <laughs> That's kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> and then recently, uh, Sally went through, uh, my wife went through um, chemothera chemotherapy for six months, uh, two years ago when she had ovarian cancer and went through that. And I'd been reading for quite a while in the Gospel of John, so I took the things that spoke to me about Jesus as a servant leader, a servant king, 
and uh, put it into 40 short devotionals, three, four pages long, about Jesus and how he models for us how to lead, both in character and in the nature of leadership, but also in the skills of leading. So leading like Jesus from John's gospel. Uh, man, this world we live in is in a lot of pain, isn't it? Um, I just came from Jordan. I went from Cape Town through uh, the Middle East and spent a few days in Jordan and spent some time with some Syrian refugees, got to sit in their homes and hear their stories, working with a team there, and uh, just so much pain. I heard on the radio yesterday, in fact, that there are 11 million people, Syrian people, who are displaced now and are refugees driven out of their country or living somewhere else within their country. There's lots of wars. There's lots of people saying things that are kind of crazy about how to respond to people. The world needs Jesus. The world is a broken place. Our world desperately needs to know that there's a God who loves, who loves them. So we could break the world up into three parts. Uh, we could talk about the Christian part of the world. It's about one-third of the world that is professing Christianity. That's everything from Catholics to Protestants to state religions. Anybody and everybody who kind of is raised in the name of church or, or religion, like the Christian religion. So one-third of the world, we could say, is Christianized. That doesn't mean everybody is born again, but that's about the percentage. Actually, that percentage has been about the same. It's gone up and down about a one-and-a-half to two percent for the last... 116 years, since about 18, 1900, sorry, 1900. So though there's been rapid growth of the church in many parts of the world, and we're living in a time when I would call it the greatest revival in the history of the church. The Spirit of God is moving on people's hearts like crazy, but yet the population keeps exploding. So there's about 7.3, 7.4 billion people on the planet now. So we're at about 32.5% of the people in the world are called Christians in one way or another. Then there's another third of the world that has, and I'm going to explain this term, has been evangelized. That means that they've, people have either heard about Jesus or they have access in their language that somebody they know can share Jesus with them or they can hear it on the radio. That's, it, it's close by to them. doesn't mean that everybody actually knows. In fact, a lot of people who have been evangelized have not actually heard the good news of Jesus, but they've got access to it. What's important for us then to consider and remember is there is another third of our planet who don't have access to Jesus and don't have anybody who speaks their language who has access to Jesus. There's giant walls of language and culture and geography and politics that isolate them Wherever they are geographically, they're cut off, and they'll never hear that Jesus loves them unless somebody learns their language and moves into their neighborhood and gets close to them and walks a road with them. Now, when I was in, uh, when I was in college and university, I started discovering this, and it became such a reality to me. And uh, one night in my, in my dorm room, my residence hall, I got on my knees I had never heard that you have to have a call to be a missionary. I just was overwhelmed by the reality that a third of the planet had never, will never have a chance unless somebody goes to them. And I read about that, and I was overwhelmed by it and moved by it. So I chased my roommate out of my room one night and locked the door and got a map of the world and got down on my knees, and I wrestled with God. And I said to God, I'm not leaving here until you give me a country. <laughs> now, you know and I know that you can't force God, but I gave it my best shot. <laughs> and I wrestled with him, and I pleaded with him, and I kind of convinced myself that maybe it was the Amazon. And I carried that in my heart for a while. But what I'm saying to you is, you don't actually have to have some kind of mysterious experience to be willing to volunteer yourself to go someplace and to share the gospel. Like God's not going to get mad at you if you say, I'm going. <laughs> Do you actually think he will like say, oh, stop that. You're messing up my plan. 
Like you can't go unless you have a, an experience. You know, I want to show you a cloud in the shape of Ethiopia. Hang on. <laughs> so I never had the Ethiopian cloud. I just knew how great he was and how many people didn't have a chance and I just volunteered. And then I found all kinds of encouragement along the way. You know, um, God, God is looking for volunteers. God is looking for people who will say, would you use me, please? I think the greatest hindrance for me from really, like, putting it out there was painful insecurity and self-consciousness. I was tall. I stood out in school like I grew really tall really quick. When I was in sixth grade, I was head and shoulders above everybody else. And I just was walking around like this bundle of self-conscious insecurity. And then I was in high school, and um, I was so painfully insecure all through those years. It's a miracle that I'm following Jesus because I was so filled with shame burdened by self-consciousness. You know, God loves to break into our hearts when we're in that place. The thing that really captivated me more than anything in those years, that God loves me, not because I do something for him or in order to get me to do something for him, but he just loves me because he loves me. He loves you. Here's the reason why. Because he loves you. And the reason that he loves you because he loves you is because he loves you. He's like full of love. And he just spills it over. So in this journey of like radical passion to take the news of Jesus to other people, I was still carrying all this insecurity in my heart, and it started kind of undermining me. And then God sent people along the path into my life. Like there was a guy, Papa Kin, who came along when I was in my 20s, and he started speaking about the Father heart of God. And the way he spoke about it, I just realized, wow, I love Jesus. I want to serve God, but I've got all this baggage. And he prayed for me one day, and God gave me such a revelation of his love. And I used to walk around for months after that with this silly grin on my face. It was like, I just wake up smiling in the morning like, yeah, he loves me. <laughs> he loves you. He loves me because he loves us. He's like, he's like adopted you. He's like taken you and me into his family and made us his own, right? Isn't that cool? Uh, I've got a, some South African friends who did not have kids, and they wanted to have a baby in the worst way, and they tried, and then they said, okay, we're going to adopt. So they went through the process in South Af Africa, and they actually, the way it worked 38, 40 years ago was the hospital called them one day and said, come quickly. And they got there, and they said, you can choose either one of these three babies. <laughs> and they were stunned, but they'd been praying and so they sit down and prayed, and then they chose a little girl. And they took her in their arms when she was a couple days old. And I asked my friend Don, I said, Don, what did you say? What was like the first words that you said to your new little adopted daughter? He said, I said to her, I choose you. I want you. You're mine. Isn't that powerful? He says to you and me, I choose you. I want you. You're mine. They decided to say to Cindy Joy every day of her life that she was adopted, that they chose her and they wanted her, and that she was somehow so special that she got that message into her heart. So um, she kind of somehow got the idea that adoption was like a kind of a superior existence <laughs> above the rest of the people. Don said one day he went out of the house when she was about three and a half, four years of age. She was running around the neighborhood and had a little spat with her friends. And she started saying, 
I'm adopted, you're not, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> So he says to you and me, and he keeps on saying, I want you. So that when we make passionate choices, it's not because our cup is not full and we want to, like, get God to love us. You can never do anything to actually make God stop loving you, and you can never do anything to make him love you more. <laughs> what he wants to do is love us so much in such a deep, profound way that everything we do then is a love response to him. Not out of duty, not out of shame, not out of insecurity, but gratitude. That's what Jesus wants. He just wants gratitude. He just wants grateful kids who say, Dad, what can I do to bring joy to your heart? I've got a re great relationship with my daughter, and uh, she says to me sometimes, Dad, what can I do just to make you and Mom happy? How can I bless you? And Father just loves to hear that. So as you experience his love, you can respond back to him and say, Daddy, thank you for choosing me and wanting me and hanging on to me. What can I do? to bring joy to your heart. I was in a prayer meeting in Australia one time, and I heard a lady praying. She prayed with tears, and she, she, she listed some of the painful things happening on the planet. She talked about women being abused. She prayed it out, not talked it in. She prayed out the injustices and the trafficking and then she prayed these words. She said, Father, in all of this pain that you see constantly, I just want to be a person who brings joy to your heart. <laughs> I want you to find somebody on this planet that will bring peace and joy to you. Father, I want to bring comfort to your heart. And that's the privilege that you and I have. He who carries the weight of a broken world in his heart. We can comfort the broken heart of our God by responding to him, by saying, Father, I want to bring joy to you, and I'd love to spread the joy to those who have never heard. Uh, when Sally and I were living in Amsterdam, there was a man who came to visit us. His name um, is Bob Pierce, Dr. Bob, we called him. And I'd heard about Dr. Bob, but never met him. And uh, when he came... I got freaked out because uh, somebody informed me that he was dying of cancer and he was like one half breath away from dying. He had been in, the, um, in a hospital in Los Angeles here in California. They had said, you have days or weeks to live. And he checked himself out of the hospital. He thought, well, if I'm going to die, I don't want to die in a hospital. So he bought a round-the-world ticket. Uh, he charged it to the organization he was working for because <laughs> he figured, you know, he's going to die and they can pay the bill. <laughs> and he headed east and he traveled and he went around and he made it, doggone it, all the way to Amsterdam. <laughs> and he arrived and he was in a wheelchair and he looked like he was close to death. So I was just praying, Lord, please don't let Dr. Bob die while he's with us. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bob told me his story. He, uh, we had several days together. We got to host him while he's in the country. And by the way, when he arrived, uh, the Queen of Holland sent a limo to pick him up at the, at the airport, and he turned it down. And I said, what's with the Queen? What's going on here? And I'm going to tell you that part of the story, but that's a little bit of who Dr. Bob was. You see, when he was in college, he went to a Christian college in Minnesota. Uh, he stuttered. He had a bad stuttering problem, so he never was invited to speak anywhere. He told me, he said, Floyd, I had a terrible voice and never have been able to sing, can't carry a tune. So nobody asked me to be in a choir or do any kind of stuff on the stage, lean worship. He said, I was not involved in sports. Um, he said, I was good at nothing. I didn't have good grades. And he said, I prayed this prayer. He said, my prayer was, God, if you ask 
people who are talented with speaking or people who can sing or people who are really smart to do something hard for you and they won't do it, I'll do it for you. Give me a chance, God, to do the things you can't find anybody else to do. So Dr. Bob said uh, he went to Korea and he, he saw the, the orphan problem, the crisis that was going on. And he started adopting orphans and he started getting other people to adopt orphans. And ended up that he got millions of people involved. And he started an organization called World Vision the largest Protestant relief organization in the world. And at the same time, he met some other guys who had a passion for young people, so they started a little organization called Youth for Christ. And then toward the end of his life, he launched something called Samaritan's Purse that uh, Franklin Graham leads now. And this was the guy that nobody ever asked to do anything. And like some of us here tonight, just know... He knew that he didn't have talent. <laughs> he just didn't, he didn't think he could do anything that would qualify him. But this one thing he had, he said, God, I'll take on anything. If you need somebody and you can't find them, I'm your man. <laughs> do you think God was upset with that? <laughs> do you think God was disappointed that somebody volunteered? <laughs> And here's what Dr. Bob said. He said, Floyd, I had so little talent. And God started putting so much in my heart. And I just knew I didn't have what it took. He said, I came to the end of my ability so quickly. And God was showing me things he wanted to do in my life. And he said, I learned something. It does not take faith to do something you can do. Faith only begins, he said, when you begin to trust God for something that you cannot do. So this is good news for you if you think you can't do anything. And if you think you can do something, you're in trouble. Because God invites us to live in God room. He wants us to come to that sense of our lives that he wants to be the difference between us and what he asks us to do. He wants us to live in that space. And you know, I've taken comfort from the fact that when God gives me a challenge, when he shows me a need and I step up to him and I start responding, that the question doesn't have to be, do I have the money? Do I have the ability? The question simply is, do you want me to volunteer? And then he comes through for me. I mean, I'm 70 years old now, and I've been doing this for a long time. And I've never, never experienced God letting me down. He has scared me to death. <laughs> but he has never let me down. And my first steps of faith were so tiny. I could just trust God for a little bit. And when I saw God through, come through for something small, like it built faith in my heart, so the next time I thought, mm, I'm going to try that. That's a little bit tougher. <laughs> Got to go a little further. It's a little harder. And then God would come through. <laughs> I'll never forget, I went to my dad, who was a pastor, and I said to him um, when I was still in college and university um, that I wanted to go on a short-term summer outreach. <laughs> And my dad, now my dad's a pastor. He's passed away now, but he said, well, like, where are you going to get the money? And he said, don't forget, you have to pay off your student loan during the summer as you work. But I just had this passion in me. I wanted to, I wanted to step out and do something adventurous for God. I wanted to see if he would come through for me. So I had enough faith for a $900 outreach, plus about $2,500 of school bills. And it was so incredibly overwhelming. So um, I said to my dad, okay, here's what I'll do. I will get on the bus, 
I will ride to the airport. I will walk up to the door of the plane. If the money has not come through, I will come back home and I'll work all summer. And he smiled and thought, about time. <laughs> now, the challenge was I was living in California here and we had to get on an airplane in Miami. <laughs> And the transport was an old yellow school bus. I used to be um, about six inches taller. <laughs> but riding on that bus, something happened to my legs. <laughs> Man, there was so a little space between. I rode all the way from California to Miami. That's a long ways on a yellow school bus, I promise you. Halfway across the country, I mean, a, a widow came to me, literally, who worked as a waitress, and she got, gave me a shoebox full of her tips. It was weighted down with coins. And she said, if you're going, I want to be a part of this. I said, I cannot take this. She said, do not die, deny me the opportunity to invest in what you're doing, please. I, I collected stuff. Because I learned, you know, the part of this thing about faith is you do the possible, God does the impossible, right? We don't sit around and do nothing. So I started collecting stuff and going door to door and selling everything I could. I actually went um, door to door collecting people. I asked them, do you have any stuff, you know, in the attic or the garage that I could have and then I'll sell it. And I tried to sell it and I had a lot left over. So then I went back door to door and sold it back to the very people. <laughs> I did that. Here's one that was really embarrassing. I had trophies from sports from high school and a couple years of college in a trophy box, and I tried to peddle my trophies. Now, you tried to sell trophies with your name on them for somebody else. <laughs> but I did everything I could and got on the bus and was going to ride all the way to Miami. And halfway across the country, I called home and my dad from El Paso my dad said you won't believe this he said your uncle came by he was a non-christian he wrote a check and it was for exactly the amount to pay all my bills and to pay the balance of my outreach and my dad was so amazed <laughs> and so was I and it built faith in You know, it built a sense of fellowship because it was other people as well. So it wasn't just some kind of mystical faith, a deep sense of gratitude for people who partnered and sacrificed, but it also put steel in my spirit. It put determination in me. And I want to encourage you tonight, if you will dare to volunteer and step out, you will, you will begin a journey with God, and you'll see God come through for you. Listen, he wants to use us, not in the kind of sense that he doesn't care for us. He wants to reveal how much he loves us. He wants to fill us with that love. And then he says, come on, let's partner together and see what will happen as we step out together. He says, come on and join me in what I'm doing. There's no one who yearns more to touch this planet of ours than God himself. I'm sorry I get excited about this. Uh, I, yeah, let me read this passage, Matthew 11, 27 to 30. I have no clue what time I should stop. <laughs> this is dangerous. I can see the clock back in the back. What time did I start? <laughs> Ten more minutes. No, no, stop. Right before nine. Okay, cool. Or 11. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I tried that one time in my dad's church. <laughs> he said, son, I believe in the everlasting gospel, but I don't want you to try and preach it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> A little before nine. <laughs> I've been reading and camping out in the Gospels for the last uh, 16 years. 
because 16 years ago, I said to myself, however long I live, I want the last half of my life and the last part of my life to be more passionately in love with Jesus than the first half. I want to be more focused on him. I want to be more in love with him. I want to drink in everything he says and does. I want it to be a part of who I am. So I'm cycling back now through the Gospels again. I, sp I sp usually spend two or three years in a Gospel. Jesus said these words in Matthew 11, verses 27 to 30. Come to me, <laughs> all you who labor <laughs> and are heavy laden. He is speaking in the context of three towns that are burdened by the heavy weight of religion and duty and performance and law and shame and control, they, out of their fear and the lies that have been told to their spirits, have rejected Jesus. And he is so overwhelmed with the fact that they have rejected him. They are say, he said to them, now come. This is who he's speaking to. People burdened by the weight that other people have put on them. You know, whether it happens by accident that we take the weights on ourselves, people might not have intended to, it, to hurt us, but we take in hurts and offenses. People put expectations on us or we sense their expectation. We feel like we have to live up to their level. And it creates this weight on us. And Jesus said, come to me if you're carrying these weights, <laughs> these obligations that are upon you and they're burdening you down. And I will give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know what a yoke is, this thing that two oxen get in, this kind of piece of wood and sometimes it's even steel and it's shape to fit around their shoulders, and so they plow together with it so they can plow together. It keeps them in unison, going in the same direction, pulling equal weight. And the picture Jesus is creating here, this kind of metaphor is that people are yoked to something. You know, actually, everybody's yoked to something. We're all yoked. What's your yoke? <laughs> Jesus says, my yoke is easy <laughs> and my burden is light. <laughs> he has come to take the heavy yoke. <laughs> He's come to take the hard yoke. He's come to take the yoke that is weighty upon our shoulders, the fear of failure, the sense of shame, those things that have happened in our life, the things we've done in secret that we wish we could just erase it from our life. He says, I've come to take all of that off of you. <laughs> and I'm going to take it upon myself. What a deal this is. Jesus says, get in the yoke with me. And guess who's going to carry the main load? <laughs> He's going to carry the weight. He's going to take us with him. Incredible. <laughs> For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is the yoke of Christ? It's to pull his load with him. It's to allow him to take our yoke off of us. And then to say to Jesus, I would like to pull your yoke with you, your burden. What is his yoke, his burden? He wants to bring his presence into the whole planet. He wants to shine his light, his goodness. He wants to invade every village, every tribe, every school, every university, every business, every place on this planet, every nation, every sphere of society. He wants to bring, can I call it his government, his rule? He's saying here in this passage, I have a kingdom. I have a government. And the way I govern is light. It's easy compared to 
what happens to broken humanity. You know, I've learned in my life that the yoke that we put on each other, the yoke of fallen humanity is a hard yoke. I've spent 25 years working with drug addicts and alcoholics and people on the street, addicted, broken people. Man, you talk about a hard way to live. We would wake up in the red light district in the middle of the night and hear people screaming at each other. We would watch prostitutes in weeks and months become hard and used. That is a hard yoke. There are a lot of burdens that people carry in life. And Jesus has come to say, I want to enter into your place with my government, my rule, and I want to lift all the heaviness, and I want to bring my presence as a servant king. And here's what he's saying. I want to wash your feet. I want to take away your burdens, take away your guilt, and I want to be there for you. I call that an easy yoke. How about you? (laughs) Isn't that a beautiful yoke? Uh, When I was in Jordan last week, uh, I was with a young man named Nathan. I was so moved being with Nathan. He's about 30 years of age, 31, 32. He's just just got a little baby, he and Kristen. Uh, We sat together, and with tears streaming down his cheeks, here's what he said. He said, Floyd, 11 years ago, I was homeless on the streets of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I was mentally ill. I was addicted to drugs. That is a heavy yoke. And then he said, a local church found me and loved me. And he said, I'm now free from mental illness. He said, I mean, with joy, He said, God is using me to touch Syrian refugees. He introduced me to Ahmed. Ahmed was uh, in the secret police in Assad's government. He was torturing people and killing people. And two and a half years ago, he couldn't take anymore. He knew if he protested, he'd lose his life. He fled in the middle of the night with his family, crossed the Jordanian border, ended up in a large refugee camp, and then went into a small town called Mafraq on the border. And there Nathan and some others found Ahmed, and they began to walk with him. I was there almost two years ago when Ahmed, for the first time, I just had the privilege of being there, visiting his home. They just said, hey, Floyd, let's go visit this guy. And he recited the story of God, the God story. Like in a half an hour, he went through the whole Bible. And then he ended up saying, I did not live a perfect life. Islam is not perfect. There's only one way to God, and God has provided a way for us (laughs) to lift off of us our sins. And Jesus is the way. (laughs) Now, at that time, he was like, he knew it, but it was not like, like gripping his heart with revelation. I met with him again with Nathan and Ahmed, and my gosh, you should have seen the, the joy in this man's heart. And you know what? He was under a new government, <laughs> and the burden of that government was a beautiful burden. <laughs> he was carrying it with joy because he was seeing people forgiven. He said, I have forgiven Assad, and I have forgiven myself. I just want people to know. He has about a dream every week. (laughs) He was just so full of God. He has entered a new land. (laughs) He has come into a place that is so beautiful. And here's Nathan glowing and smiling, and Ahmed is smiling, a murderer and a homeless man. You guys, don't you love what we get to do? Uh, Nathan said to me, Floyd, thank you very much for what you did in Pastor Bob's life. So Bob was the pastor of the church. Bob was a a long-haired hippie with his hair down the middle of his back, went through Afghanistan 40 years ago. And um, I happened to meet Bob. He came to the house where Sally and I were. We were running a halfway house, taking in world travelers. And um, Bob stayed with us. 
lived six months with us. He came to faith. I got to disciple him, walk with him, baptize him. I have this cool picture with me with long hair, Bob with long hair, doing the baptism thing. He went back to Canada, lost uh, contact with him, and didn't hear from him again until seven years ago, six years ago. And uh, a young lady wrote to me an email, and she said, you don't know me, but my name is Marisa. Uh, you led my father to the Lord 36 years ago, 34 years ago, and I'm your spiritual granddaughter. <laughs> and she said, we know about you because every time we have a baptism service, we see this picture of two long-haired guys up on the screen. <laughs> And uh, so she said, we want to surprise my dad and fly you to Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. So I chose a weekend in October, and uh, I flew to Hamilton, Ontario, and it just happened to be Bob and Joanne, his wife's, uh, their anniversary. And so both of their adult kids are on staff in the church, both of their spouses, and they were there for the anniversary meal. But they knew I was coming, but Bob did not. So I walked in, right when and they started the anniversary meal in the restaurant, and the kids stand up. The wife stands up, they're taking pictures. Bob's looking around like, what's going on? And I just walked up and said, hey, hi. Hey, you guys having a party. Can I join you? And he's like totally confused. And then he looks at me for a second. And what, I have a, one of my favorite pictures is Bob looking up like, what is happening? Just sitting there with that look on his face. And then he stood up and he looked me in the eye and you could just see a click. It's Floyd, he said. And we reconnected. And I've been back to that church once or twice a year for the last six years. They've brought teams over to Cape Town. I met hundreds of people who said to me, thank you. Thank you. I wouldn't be in the kingdom if you hadn't shared the gospel with Pastor Bob. Listen, I want to tell you something. You can have that same experience. <laughs> Bob was just a hippie kid wondering. I was just like a a Pentecostal preacher's kid trying to find my adventure in life. Nathan was a homeless kid. Achman was working for the secret police. We all have stories. Here's what Jesus says. Come to me. My burden is light. You will learn of me. Listen, what a great deal we have, eh? And every step of the way, here's something I want to promise you. Every step of the way, you know what happens? He reveals to us that he loves us more than we could have ever imagined. It just like gets deeper and richer. I, I meet people who want to kind of learn amazing doctrines of esoteric end time significance and so on and so forth. And you know what? I just want to love Jesus more. I'm like, why move on from Jesus? Like, 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 Jesus is like so cool. One guy said to me one time, Floyd, he says, you're, you're not very deep. <laughs> you're just like, all you talk about is like Jesus, loving Jesus and loving each other and loving the lost. Like, when are we going to get to the really good stuff, the meat? I said, you know, when I get this all mastered and figured out, when I, get, when I know how to love Jesus and love each other and love the lost, then I'll move on. But so far, I'm really happy where I am. <laughs> how about you? Who wants more than Jesus? <laughs> he just wants to keep filling our hearts and overflowing to us, through us, to others. And at each step of the way, if you run into a road bump, Somebody hurts your feelings. Somebody looks at you the wrong way. You kind of run back to Jesus. You know what? He's just going to love on you some more. I, I actually find great freedom in saying to Jesus, uh, I hate that person, and I would really like to kill him. <laughs> but please don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> Sometimes like when I'm really being spiritual and I'm praying and something happens and I just shift gears and I start having mental conversations telling people off. <laughs> you ever have that happen? <laughs> like all this like undealt with hostility is like. <laughs> I used to be like. Ah. 
And then I figure out the best place to deal with that was right when I'm praying and talking to Jesus. Like, Jesus, that jerk. <laughs> I'd like to take them out and then try to convince you they're just gone on a long vacation or an outreach or something. <laughs> Hey, we all run into road bumps of hurts and disappointments. Family stuff creeps back up in our hearts and old wounds kind of come back. And we thought, you know, I've said to myself, man, I thought I was healed of that. You ever said that? And Jesus just smiles and says, we're going to go deeper. <laughs> it's not like it didn't happen. It's just like, I want to give you more. You guys... I can tell you after 70 years, it just gets deeper and sweeter and better. And it's just more beautiful. Living in this space, let's call this the space of the kingdom of God. The rule of the servant king invites us into a place and a space where he's not inviting us just to believe in him, but to believe like him to become so fascinated with him that we live in this, this realm. What we're not trying to get out of this life, we're actually enjoying heaven here in this life. <laughs> Where we get to be a part of what's, what's going on in the earth. You know, we get to help shape history. <laughs> we get to be a part of changing nations. I I'll finish with this. When we lived in Amsterdam, I mean, we did a survey and we found five churches that believed the Bible in a city of a million and a half people. They said less than one-tenth of one percent of the population were church attenders in Amsterdam. Uh, we, we were the sex capital of Europe. There was a billion dollars a year of kitty porn sold from Amsterdam to the United States. There was drugs everywhere. The city was filthy. There was crime. And that's where God placed us. I want to tell you, I cried so many times. I said, God, please let me out of here. <laughs> Why did you put me here? This is so hard. The city is so far from you. They, you know, Amsterdam numbers, they just loved attacking us. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was tough. One day, one of our team members in our church came to me, and she said, I'm praying a strange prayer. I'm praying for a drug famine to come to Amsterdam, because there's just drugs everywhere. I mean, there was like 15 to 18,000 prostitutes in the red light district, and they advertised the red light district all over the world. The, tu the tourist industry promoted it. And here's this young, single girl, and she says, I'm praying for a drug famine to hit Amsterdam. I'm praying for the drugs to dry up. And she had so much faith. So we started praying. We fasted and prayed. Three months later, headlines of the newspaper, drug famine hits Amsterdam. <laughs> one little girl, one single follower of Jesus. Today, there's over 400 churches in Amsterdam not including house churches. Statistically, they have tracked the decrease of crime. As the church has grown, the city has prospered. A young Jewish guy was elected to office in the mayor's office. He became like a vice mayor. He did a study and he said, hey, wait a minute. The sex industry is hurting Amsterdam. Like we're losing tax money. <laughs> and uh, people are being trafficked. Money's being laundered. So they closed down the red light district. <laughs> I was back three years ago. I'll be back again in August. I was like, what happened? God used a young Jewish guy. You know, we get to be a part of changing history. Come on, you guys. I don't know what dream you have, but I want to tell you there's a bigger one and there's a better one. <laughs> And it's that, that God room dream where we can step into a place where it's impossible for us to do something, but God says, come on, 
watch me, I'll work with you, and I'll give you the privilege of being a part of it with me, and we'll see the world changed. Jesus is interested in nothing less than world revolution. <laughs> he wants to chase the devil away. <laughs> Some people have an end-time theology that it's going to get worse and worse, and then finally Jesus will have to come back. <laughs> My theology is it's going to get better and better as the church moves out more and more, and the devil's going to end up having his end-time convention in a telephone booth. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Jesus reigns. His kingdom is here, and he invites us to be a part of it. He invites you to be a part of it. And you can volunteer, even if you have not had a vision of a cloud in the shape of Ethiopia. <laughs> Some people come to me and say, I haven't had a call. God hasn't touched my heart. If you say that to me, here's how I'm going to respond. I'll say, get close to me. I'm going to touch your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, you're just so incredible that you, you left everything, glory and power, and you came to us, you stepped into our world in the midst of our broken humanity, and then you called us to do it with you, to be a part of your family. Thank you. And Lord, somewhere in that connecting point between you moving on our hearts and us responding that some people call the call, but Lord, I'm thinking that we get to actually volunteer. I pray tonight your spirit will intersect and encounter our hearts, and we will respond to you, and we'll say yes to you. If you've said yes to him, say it again. <laughs> Amen. If you've never said yes to him, just take that baby step toward him. It's not about your ability. It's about your availability. It's not about how great you are, your skills. It's about you saying, Jesus, I'll take this little step. Please help me. And he longs, he loves that when you step toward him. If there's stuff in your heart that's keeping you back from that kind of abandonment or just beating you up in the midst of that abandonment, Jesus just wants to lift some of that stuff off of you tonight. You know, without a long, big appeal, I just want to say, if you're carrying some stuff that's just like hassling your heart, there's like you feel like you're getting beat up and there's lies in your spirit, whatever it's from the past, or your family stuff, would you just come down here and say, Floyd, there's stuff that's just keeping me from really being free and enjoying this adventure, this journey with Jesus. Just step up, step up and come on down here and say, Floyd, I want to get free. If you've actually said to Jesus before, yes, but you've kind of gotten caught up in the stresses and the temptations and the pressures and you've backed off of it, we have these times so we can renew our yes to Jesus. I invite you to come. If you've said yes, like I've had many times, but you just want to have the joy of saying it to him again, then in any way you want to, you want to come and kneel, you want to stand, whatever you want to do, but just some way of saying to him, Jesus. And we'll have people that will just mingle with you and pray for you, pray blessings over you. Just come on, let's make, let's meet with Jesus.